Yes, so the book is called Bountiful Instructions for Enlightenment. <laughs> and it's a little bit of an ironic title because obviously I don't have the answers uh, about what to do to get enlightened. But I've been practicing Hinduism and uh, also Buddhism throughout my life. And so part of this, the theme of the book is around those explorations and the sometimes comical or outrageous or bizarre things that happen in that process. And um, so it's poetry and also performance texts. I used to be a performance artist, so I did my own one-woman show, and uh, the script to that is also in the book. So that script is called Avatars, uh, Gods for a New Millennium. And the idea behind the show was it was at the turn of the millennium, and a lot of people were joining cults and thinking that the world was going to end. So I had this idea, what if um, all of the different gods and goddesses got together and had kind of a contest, like a reality show, to get the audience to join their own cult. So in that show, I became all of the characters, the gods and goddesses, and I tried to recruit the audience uh, into my cult as them. And uh, so now I've rewritten that play, that sh one woman show, into a play for multi characters and multiple actors. And so that's part of the book. And then the rest of the book is poems, all of which in some way or another touch on this theme of uh, enlightenment, but also the body and all of the questions that we have, I think, as human beings around suffering and what does it mean and what is the purpose of uh, life and our struggles. So in, in the sense that it's possible to sum up what poetry is about, I, my hope is that the poems really address those issues. And of course, poetry is always about language itself. Too. It's both. It's I take it very seriously in terms of the craft as a poet of really working on on it and you know making it as precise and interesting in terms of the language. So that side is utterly serious. But at the same time, uh, I think that it's helpful to bring a sense of humor. Um, to life. <laughs> and so even the play, although it is humorous, but then each of the characters is quite dark. So the play also deals with suicide, abortion, AIDS. Uh, one of the characters in the play is the goddess of HIV, which is actually based on a real story in Karnataka where there was a village. And in this village, there was a man who was ostracized because he was HIV positive. And so the villagers wanted to kick him out and everything. And there was a school teacher in that village who took a statue of Ardhanarishvara, who is a half male, half female um, incarnation of Shiva, and uh, took this, so took this murti, this idol, and put him in a little uh, handmade temple and with kumkum, this red uh, powder, painted HIV on the forehead of that deity and made it a temple where people who were HIV positive could go and, you know, pray. And so by doing that, that creative act, he wanted to say really to his villagers also that, you know, this person is not as outside the embrace, right, of what we believe in and who we are allowed to, that we're all created, um, you know, and beloved really of whatever power there is in the universe. And so that is a really serious issue. And in my version of the show, I become the goddess of HIV. So I say, I am that you know, um, being who was created in this moment. Um, and I sort of exhort the audience to do something about what I say is this little demon called HIV, this virus, and that only the audience is capable of defeating this virus. So it's humorous. Um, but it also grapples with really serious issues. And I think that's where humor is the most interesting, actually. Like humor that um, is just strictly making fun of someone or slapstick. I find that a lot less interesting than humor that actually goes into things that really are difficult and helps us deal with those in some way. 
No, because I think sometimes the things that we laugh at are actually the things that are that make us really uncomfortable. And discomfort is a good place for deepening our understanding. So for me personally in my life, I know the times that I've learned the most are when I've been very uncomfortable and had to stretch, you know, and had to develop. Like if I'm very stuck with writing, for example, then usually it's because I'm writing about something or in a form that I don't know enough about or I haven't thought enough about and I need to really figure that out. And so that difficulty and struggle with the text and the words themselves is the path to getting me to the next place. So, you know, it's possible and it, I certainly do it to really grapple and be suffering and, you know, agonized over it. But it's also very helpful if in the middle of that I at some point look up and go, oh, well, this is also very humorous and ridiculous. <laughs> That's a great question. I think one audience is certainly um, people who are interested in finding new scripts to perform. So, uh, you know, young actors maybe and uh, theaters. Uh, I'd, I'd love to see some of the work in the book become available to college colleges and uh, performers it's you know some of it is a little bit adult content so I wouldn't say younger than college but um, for that reason we're publishing it under an open copyright so anybody can buy the book and then perform from it if they're not performing for profit and we're publishing it through a new press called the great Indian great sorry called the great Indian poetry collective and so we are a collection of poets in Bangalore who are publishing new works from India. So uh, we did our first book last year called Geography of Tongues by Shikha Malavia, which I believe there's another author TV interview on. And then this is the second book. And after that, we will also be publishing two to four books a year in the years coming up. So what we're really looking at is people who are interested in poetry, but not necessarily uh, the old poetry standards, because I think a lot of us have these ideas about poetry that it's mm, Tagore and Yeats and you know sort of some of the very old uh, ways of writing poetry. But in fact, there are a lot of amazing contemporary poets in India. So we're really excited to both you know bring those people in as people we could publish and also start building the audience for poetry. I think that poetry education. Uh, has not necessarily served the, the readership very well because it's become this very dry thing that you kind of study as much as you must for your exam and then you immediately say, oh, thank God, now I'm done with poetry until the next set of exams. Um, and, you know, what we're finding is that actually poetry is really uh, an amazing way to intervene in issues that are very alive, daily contexts that are very alive, and um, at the same time, it's short. So it doesn't take the commitment that it takes to, say, pick up a novel or a nonfiction book, um, but that you can, you, know, you can read a poem while you're waiting for the bus. So we're also starting this app called In Poetry, where we're uh, going to give it to people to have on their Android or their iPhone or whatever, and they can have a, a new poem a week that will be designed for just reading in a short way. So in that way, I think we're really building the audience at the same time as we're publishing. Um, but yeah, I, I think also, you know, there's a poem in this book about um, what happens when you're meditating and uh, some mosquito or something is around <laughs> and, you know, completely ruins your concentration. And, and why is it, you know, when we have all these paintings and statues of the Buddha, none of them ever shows him going, you know, <laughs> like that. So this, these are things that come up as we all, uh, you know, many of us try to find some inner peace through yoga, meditation or whatever, but some of the practical elements of that are not so easy. Um, and so the last line of that poem is, how did the Buddha say to the she mosquito, you with your fertile thirst, come to me and drink, right? So how did this enlightened being find that level of compassion for another being also that even his blood, he could not be distracted by a small being taking his blood, but he could just be peaceful and give it. 
I think poetry can be defined as a commitment to saying the biggest thing possible with the smallest number of words possible. That's my uh, idea of poetry. But I think each poet you speak to would have a very different definition. You know, there is an awful lot of very amateur poetry out there, and I think it's wonderful for people to write in any form that they want to express themselves. But I also think as you commit to becoming a real craftsperson, there is a difference between, you know, something that someone jots down because it expresses how they're feeling in that moment versus something that someone who really has taken the trouble to study the craft and to read other poets, what they'll produce. And so I do think that there are two uh, almost very distinct fields of enterprise, both of which come under the title poetry, um, which I don't think all poetry must have rhythm or rhyme or anything. I mean, modern poetry is really quite far from any kind of regular use of that. but. It's important to know what those conventions are and also to know how to use them. So nowadays in poetry, um, most poets, uh, I think it's safe to say, are not working in very formal uh, structures such as sonnets or guzzles and whatnot. Most poets now are working with more sophisticated versions of that. So within the rhyme, within, sorry, within the line, there could be internal rhymes and a rhythm that takes place over the poem, but in an irregular way. Uh, so those are the things that a poet pays attention to. And the sound of the words, the beat of the poem, the way the words orally relate to one another, all of that is really important, um, although it might not look like the traditional forms. Yes, so the play is, um, it has poems embedded in it. So each of the deities in the play uh, has sort of a way that they come in, come onto the stage and come into the scene and there is conflict among them and all that. But at some point they have a monologue, which is really their poem, their persuasive text. And in that sense, they are saying uh, a little bit what I said before that the grandest version, the most kind of seductive and beautiful and um, powerful version of what they have to say is condensed into this poem that is the center of centerpiece of their time on stage. Different, yes. And some of the poems in the earlier sections of the book are also performance uh, oriented. So for example, one of the poems is a dialogue between Achilles and Arjun. Right, so these are two great heroes of epics uh, from Greece and from India. And they both were reluctant warriors who uh, in the first instance decided they didn't want to fight and then had a, an encounter with a god or goddess that brought them into the battle, right? And so in the poem, uh, it's really a dialogue between the two of them. And I've performed it with another person where uh, I've played uh, Arjun and she's played Achilles and we do it almost as a little mini play um, and these two so the poem is called much later Achilles and Arjun speak of the gods and they are speaking to each other and also speaking across each other sort of you know to the audience um, about this and the poem is set much later after the wars and at the end of the poem you realize they're both in a hospital ward for veterans who have post-traumatic stress disorder. So there's kind of this, you know, ironic, uh, humorous situation that they're in, but really they're talking about what is the purpose of war? Why did we do all that killing? You know, were we, were we correct? Actually, they're questioning what was the definition of nobility that we followed at that time? Why did we let ourselves be seduced by these gods? into killing people that we actually were very close to. It's a very strange book. I think that's a great way of putting it. And one of the reasons that we wanted to publish in a collective is that we wanted each author to have a lot more control than they might have in a normal publishing environment where, um, you know, I've published in those environments and it's beautiful and important to have that support team. 
um, where marketing is kind of one of the big Im impulses and influences on the manuscript. But for poetry, you know, there's no profit motive anyway. So given that that is not there, we really wanted each poet to have control of how their manuscript took place. And that has allowed um, this book to come together in a thematic way rather than a kind of category way. So, um, so we'll see. It could succeed or fail. Uh, but it is nice to have strange books. And I think some of the you know, some of the most beautiful books that I can think of are actually very, very strange, and yet they find their own audience. Um, I think that there is a lot of formula-based publishing these days where, you know, something is successful and then everyone decides that now there should be, you know, thousands of teenage vampire novels. Um, and there's an audience for that, but also I think the audience is a little bored. And these days, a book is not just competing with other books. A book is competing with the internet and with the iPad and with all kinds of other things for the reader's attention. So uh, Strange could perhaps be an asset.